So, we are nearing the end of our studies. I don't know if you know that. I don't know if you realize. Let me just mention to you, the, the end of the year is in sight. I mean, I know most of you are not aware of that. This little thing hanging from the ceiling has nothing to do with any sense of liberation from this institution. I realize that this is just, uh, you know, it's like a chain. A chain, yes. And the chain is gradually losing its power over you, isn't it? Kind of every day it goes up a little bit. So we are dealing with 20th century characters, and, and the 20th century is hard to manage, but I'm doing this at least the best way I know how. And the two people I'd like to deal with right now, I'll, I'll at least start, and we probably won't finish this today. The first of them is a guy named Martin Heidegger. H-E-I-D-E-G-G-A-R, Martin Heidegger, probably considered, I would say, one of the very small handful of most influential philosophers of the 20th century. Hard to pin down, usually placed in the class of philosophers known as existentialists, but he himself repudiated that, and he would be very much unhappy for me as a teacher of philosophy to stand up and say he was an existentialist, so proceed with caution, but that's where he's generally placed. Whether he likes it or not, that does seem to be the kind of outlook that he represents. He was certainly a major influence in the mind of a guy by the name of Jean-Paul Sartre, who we're going to look at soon, maybe this week, certainly next week. The other uh, character that was heavily influenced by Martin Heidegger is someone you've heard of. And you have some passing familiarity with him. His name is Rudolf Bultmann. And many others. But I'm just saying in terms of 20th century influence, both Sartre and Bultmann would be tied to existentialism. It's hard for Martin Heidegger to deny the, the connection, even though he doesn't like it. I think the force of his influence and, and so on requires that we put in there. So I'm putting in there and I'm leaving out the other major strand of 20th century philosophy because I just don't like it. But the guy that would be associated here is Wittgenstein and it goes with the entire philosophical movement known as linguistic analysis. Uh, Bertrand Russell would be connected with this tradition. Philosophy of the 20th century tends to run on one of two tracks. One of them existentialism, the other one linguistic analysis, or what's called analytical philosophy. Analytical philosophy became very much absorbed in the use of language and words and communication and how it happens and what it means. We've touched on this a little bit in this course, but not much, because I'm going to tell you personally, I find it deadly boring. And anything that I find boring, I have a very difficult time getting anyone else juiced up about it. You know, it's just I, I have to teach where I'm interested, and so I tend to follow the track of stuff I like. <laughs> And I tend to avoid stuff I don't like. And I don't like linguistic analysis. I don't. As I think it's, a, it's not philosophy. It's anti-philosophy, in my opinion. So I'm hostile to it as a... But I'll tell you, if you go off and major in philosophy somewhere, the chances are 100% that you're going to have to deal in, seriously with linguistic analysis. So I've done you a bit of a disservice here by not doing more with it. But so far, it just hasn't primed my pump. You know, so I'm just going to leave it out. But be aware of it. For purposes of your notes, be aware you've got these two traditions. Existentialism has produced the culture, I believe, that shapes your life the most conspicuously. Postmodernism flows out of existentialism, and you are in a postmodern culture. Deconstruction, all of that. 
flows out of existentialism, and so I think I'm speaking more to at least the popular experience of culture that you will probably have to deal with, but be aware from a technical point of view, this is also out there and maybe, maybe more important. All right, so Heidegger we're going to put in the existential camp, though he himself calls himself an ontologist. All right, that's the word he gives himself, an ontologist. Meaning he's concerned about being. Which most existentialists couldn't give a rip about being. They, they care about becoming, about existing not about being or essence. Martin Heidegger, so let me give you a few little talking points, just kind of things to know. He is in the death of God tradition. He is in the tradition of Nietzsche. He himself says we're living in the dark ages. We tend to think of the dark ages as you know, five or six hundred years ago. He says we're living in the dark ages today. I tend to agree, by the way. However, for him, he thinks in some ways all times are dark ages. We're always groping in the mist, trying to make sense out of it. Heidegger's trying to find what he calls a unified ontology. Unified ontology. Now, usually, now this is so think now. If you've been sleeping so far, wake up for this little part. Um, usually, when we think of people who are ontologists, people thinking about being, we think of folks like Descartes. We think of Plato. We think of idealism. We think of fixed eternal realities. We think of essence precedes existence. You know, that's what we think of, right? We all think of that. When I say an ontologist, that's where your mind goes. It goes to classical rationalism. That's not where Heidegger goes. That's why he's a little different. He calls himself an ontologist, but he does it a little bit differently. And the way he plays with this is with the word being. His most important book, which by the way is one of the most awful books to read, uh, so I'm not recommending this. Don't read it unless you have to, unless some prof punishes you by making you read it. But uh, his most important book is called Being and Time. Okay. Well notice the use of the word being there, being and time. What makes Heidegger a little different, and one of the points he makes right off the bat in this work, is that traditionally the word being has been used as a noun. A human being, right? That's a noun. But it's also possible to use it as a verb, isn't it? Being is kind of a verb. To be or not to be. That is the question. Whether it is. Oh, no, that's it. All right, so he wants to use it as a verb, and that's why he doesn't think he's a traditional ontologist, because he thinks being must be understood as something that's happening in time. Being and time. Time moves. Things are not static in time. <coughs> things are shifting. Things are altering. Things are caught in the forces of time. And he gives us a little phrase, he gives us several little interesting phrases that uh, we'll come across. The first of these is Dasein, German. I'm, I'm not giving you his story, by the way. Um, it's an interesting story. This is footnote, unrelated to my immediate discussion, but uh, he was a German philosopher, and he was probably at the height of his prestige during Nazi Germany and one of the kind of 
shadow aspects of Heidegger is he was fairly sympathetic to the Nazis during the Nazis' rise to power. It was quite an embarrassment to him later when he had to repudiate his earlier endorsements of Nazi policies and so on. So he's, uh, he's a guy that's somewhat controversial in terms of his personal history, but I'll leave that for some other time. But anyway, the term here is das sein. Anybody do German? <coughs> is there any German? Do you, do you, can you make heads or tails of that? You know what that would mean? Das sein, roughly? Is it da and then sein? Or is it das? Well, it's, oh, well, it's, uh, I don't do German, so I'm not sure. I think da sein is the way of, like, da sign. That's okay. the I don't know. Would it make a difference the other way? Das ein? Yeah. What would that be? The one. Oh, no? No, that's not it. Okay. All right, well, uh, as I understand it, I'm not a German guy, but uh, the, the basic meaning of it is being there. Being there. That's the way you'll typically hear it carried over. So he's concerned about being, but for him, being is always happening somewhere. You're not just a being in the abstract sense. You are a being in a particular sense, in a particular place. Right now, you are in a state of being in class. You know. And that's different from being, from being playing Frisbee. You ever notice that, Ben? They're really quite different. Two different realities. And so the only way we can understand your state of being is in terms of where you are, the, the, the there in which you find yourself. So his, he's an ontologist, but unlike others, he's, he's emphasizing subjectivity. It's your subjective experience of being somewhere, being there that is really at the heart of his philosophy. And that being there always works its way out in time. You're in a particular place at a particular time. So you're caught in this, so this sounds a little bit like, uh, more like Heraclitus, you know, this kind of feeling that you're in some sort of state of flux. And that's why people have tied him to existentialism. He says, when you are a being in time, it creates for you a sense of concern. I know this all sounds pretty simple to say it this way. If you read his book, you'll be surprised how complicated he can make these things. So you are in a state of being in a place of time, and that inevitably uh, gives rise to you a feeling of concern, it, even a feeling of anxiety, or what he calls a feeling of thrownness. As if you had been thrown into this circumstance of being there. Thrownness. Geworfenheit. Now, to just help you all kind of get a feel for this, this way I want you to think about I may have mentioned this to you once separately, but this is where it should properly come up. And imagine that you have just awakened out of a deep coma and you have amnesia, okay? Just imagine that. It's kind of the way most of you feel every morning when you wake up, you know? Who am I, where am I? Then it gradually comes back to you. All right, so I want you to imagine that you have just awakened from a deep coma and you have complete amnesia. You remember nothing. You are just completely blank the only other thing that you need to be aware of is that you have awakened from a deep coma with complete amnesia in a state of falling from an airplane. 
Okay? So you have just come to a sense of consciousness and you are conscious of yourself for sure. You have no memory of how you got here, but you have a very distinct sense that you're heading toward planet Earth and there's nothing you can do about it. You are falling. And that's what that's the idea of thrownness. You have been thrown into existence. And here you are. You don't know how you got here. You don't have any memory of how you were produced by some machine or some god or some anything, alien. You just are here, thrown into your existence. And you know that somewhere out there in the future, you're going to die, splat. You're going you're gonna to hit Earth. And it's going to be over. And that'll be the end of you. And in the meantime, there you are. Docile, being there. You're a being in time, motion, and you're concerned about it. You can't get off this train. There's no parachute. There's no escape. There's no hope. And there you are, falling. You see. And Heidegger says that is the state of every human being. Now, he says, he's an atheist, you know. He says, we find this a very painful thought, and so we concoct all sorts of meta-narratives to get ourselves out of the difficulty. We invent, oh, there must be God, there must be heaven, oh, yeah, this is, yeah. We start kind of coming up with these extraordinary explanations, but the bottom line is the only reason we do all that is because we're in this state of deep concern. And all of those things are fictions, Heidegger says, and they really are harmful to us. We'd be better off just to face the music. You're going to die. And in the meantime, you're just falling toward that inevitable destiny. He says the present threat of non-being, that is the, the fact that you don't know quite when you're going to hit the earth. You know, you can't see how far away it is. You just know it's coming. It's like you're falling through a cloud. It could be 15 feet away. Bam! It's going to happen in the next you know, two seconds. It could be you know, years away. But every one of you in this room is going to die. And you have some sense of it. There is a sense of your mortality. Now, for you, you're not too worried about it. You're young, you're healthy. Death looks like it's a long way off. It isn't necessarily, is it? Not for any of us. For me, it's much closer. To be honest with you, I kind of see it coming. You know, you know how when you're about to rear end a, a car and and you get that, that rush right at the last moment. It's coming up too fast and you can't get your foot on the brake in time. Wham! You, know? you ever been in that? Is it just me? <laughs> they call that ground rush when you're falling and all of a sudden the earth is coming at you so fast you can't respond, you know? Well, we're all kind of, uh, what's that? Ground rush, yeah. Yeah, I suppose it is. Yeah. I think it's more a parachute term. You know? <laughs> you know? ah, too late. But, uh, <laughs> yeah. So it's this fact that you are in a state of constant anxiety and concern and you don't know when See, that's part of the time problem. You're being in time, and you don't know how much time you've got to deal with. You don't know if it's a limited amount or a lot, but it's one thing you do know. The clock is ticking toward this inevitable D-Day in which you're going to have face non-being, and that concern, that thrownness, produces in you a state of anxiety, and it's not a specific fear of a specific thing. It's a sort of undefined 
generalized fear connected with your state of being there. And that's the word that Heidegger gave to Western culture that you've all heard and probably used. And now I want you to know where it came from. And it is the wonderful word, you know, the word for anxiety. That we sometimes, what is it? Go ahead, say it, you said it. Angst. Angst, and you even pronounced it right. Not angst. Miss <laughs> Garfield and I, now of course Mrs. Wilson, so I have to treat her with a bit more respect. Not much. <laughs> you know, probably of all, we, we agreed on about a 99.9% .9 of everything. We were soulmates in some ways, but the one thing we could never agree to was how to pronounce that word. And I am here to tell you that I'm right. <laughs> so, just get that straight. But anyway, Heidegger tells us that this feeling, this feeling of being thrown, uh, tossed out of an airplane, falling, not knowing when you're going to hit, but knowing it's inevitably going to happen and you're going to be plunged into non-being, produces now in your heart angst, anxiety. You hear people use that term a lot in our culture, and sometimes they use it correctly and sometimes they don't. If you are, for example, Matthew, running through a jungle and there is a tiger chasing you and your heart is beating and your adrenaline's pumping and you're running as fast as you can, hearing these pitter-patter of little paws, you know, behind you getting ever closer, you will feel some fear. Is that angst? It is not, and why not? Why not? It's more like something that you're fearing of something, but it's not really like present there. Angst you know, is, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And that's exactly right. Right there, it's, you know, like, you know, you're just trying to get away. From. That's right, that's right. If you are feeling fear of a particular threat at a particular moment, that's fear, you know. Angst is when there's nothing threatening you in that particular moment. You're just sitting out on the back deck sipping a little lemonade on a lovely day and you still feel creeping anxiety. That's angst. It's when there's no immediate threat and you still feel it. I think Christian theology has done a lot with this. Of course, you wouldn't say Christian theology follows Heidegger in very many points at all. But Martin Luther said famously, the pagan trembles at the rustling of a leaf. Not a great line. The pagan is living in a universe where something alien is threatening him. That, you know, Romans chapter 1 tells us when they knew God, they refused to acknowledge him as God. Well, you can, you can refuse to acknowledge what you know to be true, but you can't quite make it go away. You can throw it in the closet, lock the door, throw away the key. It's still in the closet, and you know it, you know. And the pagan has this uneasy, chilly feeling that there's something bad out there lurking in the universe. And I personally, I mean, I don't want to, you know, drift too far away from Heidegger, but I think that's what's going on in his psyche. I think it's more than just... You know, I think he's repressed the knowledge of God, and that's what's producing the angst, rightly so. But all he can do is just say it's the, the fear of not being. But I, he does put his finger on something that I think is very much a, a true of the average human being, especially, obviously, the average human being who has no sense of the grace of God. Just out there on his own or her own, that person has angst. And you as a Christian apologist, do well to reach that level of their psyche. And you typically won't do it by throwing the teleological argument at them. You know? I believe in the teleological argument. I think those arguments work, but I think when it comes to representing to somebody who's possessed of 
this kind of psychological state, projecting to them the gospel. You've got to get past the, the arguments and somehow get to that level where they are feeling uneasy in the universe. And that's not easy to do because people are very defensive. They are very fearful to go there. One of the most important words in our culture is the word ah, muse. Right? We like amusement parks. We like to amuse ourselves. We like amusing things, right? We like all that. What does the word amuse mean? What's its fundamental meaning? Anybody you know? If you had to give an etymological analysis of this word, it is? Without thought. Yes. To amuse, to prevent thought. <laughs> to muse is to think. Not just to think about, you know, how you're going to pass the next exam, but to think about what things really mean. That's muse. Music is intended to help you muse. That's where that word comes from, you know. Well, we have music, not much of it anymore, which helps you. But we also have forces that are attempting to prevent you from thinking. To keep you always giddy, always giggling, always kind of superficial, always skating across the top of life, never stopping, never at what's going on here. Well, now you're, you, you're Christians. You hopefully have escaped that, but you're living in a culture where people are just dying daily to distract themselves from what really is, what's it all about, you know. And that's why it's not so easy to get to that level, because they're going to want to throw up all kinds of distractions and, you know, this or that, and try to avoid the conversation or get you off onto some other... And if you can keep pressing in, you have to kind of earn the right to do this to the level that they are feeling angst. Then you can talk to them. And you may, you know, bring them to Christ in just such a conversation. We're going to hear about Francis Schaeffer from Stephen. And I don't want to steal his thunder, but Francis Schaeffer makes this, and I, I probably mentioned this to you before, so pardon me for, you know, it's one of the great privileges of old age. You can repeat things and say, oh, I'm sorry, I forgot I said that. Because I'm old, you know. But uh, anyway, Francis Schaeffer, when he first started out, this fireball apologist, you know, he loved to dismantle the atheists who would come across his path. But he didn't realize how powerful his arguments were he would kind of go pressing into that level of angst without much ceremony. He was very good at doing it. Just kind of force open the door and go right in and force people to face their own anxiety about their own existence. And after he had one or two of those people go out and commit suicide after they had talked to him, he decided he had to be a little more gentle. You have to be gentle with atheists. They are delicate. They are fragile. They show a bold face because they're so scared. They act tough. They talk me. They, they act like they got everything together because they are horrified at what their inner psyche is really telling them about things. You have to be gentle with them. Firm but gentle. That's what Schaefer learned over the years. You've got you to treat these people with a little bit of, you know, kind of, kind of, not too much, not too fast. You could push them right over the edge. So anyway, that's all. So I, at this point, I think Heidegger has helped us. I think he's given us something useful, especially as Christians. We can appreciate his explanation for angst is misguided, in my opinion, but his recognition that it lies at the heart of the human experience of existence is pretty good. And he, uh, I think, helps us all appreciate what some folks are going to day, day in and day out. Yeah. So how does he account for humans being aware, how, how does he account for our unique ability to perceive this kind of Oh, as opposed to animals like the yeah. uh, giraffe or Alex the lion or somebody like that? Yeah. Uh, good question. I, I am not sure he gives a very adequate explanation, but I haven't read all of Heidegger, so maybe it's tucked away in some deep chapter somewhere. Uh, he does seem... <laughs> To, I mean, I, I would say he's an atheist and he probably subscribes to Darwin, Darwinian explanations of how we got here. 
And that's a, you know, that's a question that all of those folks have to kind of wrestle with, is how come we're the ones who are reflecting on it? How come our most intelligent cousins in the animal world don't <coughs> apparently feel much anxiety about these things? You know, the last chimpanzee I ran into wasn't sitting there wondering about, you know, this. It's, we're the ones who have this. I don't know. I, I, I'd like to know the answer to that. I'm not sure what it would be. Good question. All right, so that's basically Heidegger. I, that's, you know, there's much more to say, but that's what I want you to get. I think that's the core of the, uh, the contribution he made. And I'm going to start Boltmann now, unless there's other comments, questions, thought about Heidegger. So far, so good. Kind of get the flavor for him. He's, he's, a, he's, he's hard to read. What I want you to appreciate about him is in spite of the fact that he's a very technical philosopher, he's not a popularizer of philosophy, he did make these contributions. So every time you hear the word Angst, especially, you should think of Heidegger. And you'll often, even though you may not hear the word Geworfenheit or Throne Nest, uh, you'll, you'll see it described, even in popular media, you'll, you'll hear that described if you're listening for it. And that's, I think, another contribution you might want to keep in mind for him. All right, fair enough. All right, well, as it turns out, Martin Heidegger and Rudolf Bultmann both taught at the same university. So they were acquainted. And Bultmann was influenced by Heidegger in ways that we'll mention in a minute. I'll give you a little bit on his background. Boltmann was born in 1884. He's only a few years younger than Heidegger. Boltmann died in 1976 having taught for about 30 years at the University of Marburg. M-A-R-B-U-R-G, Marburg. He started in the same circles as Karl Barth. And at one point in their careers, they shared a whole lot in common. They were friends and associates. They were both part of the confessing church movement in Germany during the rise of the Nazis. And they both were involved in producing the Barman Confession. But, you know, if you were to say on a spectrum, you know, if, if, let's say, let's say uh, orthodoxy was here, uh, let's say liberalism was here, and so Bart, his neo-orthodoxy kind of jumps over the line and winds up right about here. How would you picture Boltmann? It's sort of like he leaps out here so far that he comes back around and winds up <laughs> he outdoes Bart in, you know, the problem is he, this is why we finally call Boltmann not a neo-orthodox, but we call him a neo-liberal. He winds up vastly more liberal than the liberals, you know, in a sense. I don't know that that's exactly right. You need, I mean, even putting it that way is not quite correct. But anyway, that diagram is not very helpful, but I'll try to explain what I mean. Basically, the contribution that Boltmann makes in 20th century biblical studies is the notion that we must demythologize the Bible. That's probably the most important single term connected with Boltmann. You may recall that back in the good old days when life was simple, 
and you were learning from Mr. Gore the basic hermeneutical approaches to the Bible. You recall that? And we said there's the orthodox view. Remember that? The Bible is the word of God. Then you have the liberal view. And a phrase would be what? Anybody? Megan? The Bible contains, contains the word of God. That would be the old 19th century liberal view. You've got to go looking for it. It's hiding in there somewhere. You know? And then you have Bart reacting to liberalism, giving us a neo-orthodox neo view of the Bible. And the catchphrase we used for that was, Jordan, the Bible becomes, becomes the word of God in a kind of an existential moment. The Bible is never equated with the word of God, but God reveals himself in the event of encounter. We talked about that a little bit with Bart last week. And now you've got the... the uh, neoliberal view and, and the term um, I, I used, the phrase I used with this was that the Bible mythologizes the Word of God and so as you read it you must demythologize it. And so Boltmann gives us that. That's, this is a term that is distinctively Boltmannian. And it's that that I think we need to understand. What he says is, he says, all traditional approaches to the Bible have been wrong. Because they all approach it based on some kind of objective. Focus. We're, we're concerned about approaching the Bible as an objective thing. He says everybody does this, everybody's wrong for doing it. Um, the traditional Orthodox Christian approaches the Bible objectively in what sense? What would you, how would you describe Trevor? The traditional, or that would be you, by the way. You are going to approach the Bible objectively. And what would be the, uh, what would that mean to say you're going to approach the Bible objectively? Well, I would think that would mean to take every word as truth, even the myths or miracles. Okay, sure. That, that certainly, and so that, that's what you do. And now in what sense does that mean you're taking the Bible, you're treating it objectively? That's a good answer. Anyone want to supplement that? Ben, take the Bible objectively. What does that mean? <clears throat> well, to interpret it, well, let it interpret itself. Okay. Um, for us not to have any um, presupposed ideas about what. Okay, it exactly. So that's the idea. So both of those are good answers. I shouldn't come to the Bible, at least, at least theoretically, I shouldn't come to the Bible with my own agenda. I should come saying to the Bible, what do you want to say to me? More than coming to the Bible saying, I want you to answer this question, or coming with sort of a prior disposition toward the Bible. You know what I'm saying? When, I, when you flip the Bible open in the morning for your morning devotions, and you're approaching it as I think you should, objectively you're saying, okay, God, I want you to speak to me through the words of this text and tell me what I need to hear. And it's not like you're forcing God. I want you to address this question, that question, where should I go to college, what girl should I marry, and what's going to be my career. You know, you don't go into it sort of with this you know, loaded set of expectations. Maybe God doesn't want to talk to you about those things today. Maybe he's got some other topics he'd like to raise in, our, in your conversation with him. To come with an objective view of the scriptures to say, let the Bible speak for itself. Fair enough. Every traditional view of the Bible, even the quadriga, even the medieval quadriga, as fanciful as it was, still thought there's an objective sense to the Bible. And that we should come in some ways tabula rasa. We should come asking the Bible to speak, not forcing it, in a sense, by our prior understanding to speak in a certain way on certain topics. Liberalism also, he says, treated the Bible objectively. How so? Spencer, what do you think would be the way in which liberalism still treated
treats the Bible objectively. Maybe liberalism is the Bible contains. Yeah. Right? Right. Maybe just, I guess, just the parts that they would still validate. As That's right. The scripture. That's exactly right. Now, why would that represent taking the Bible objectively? <clears throat> You gave a good answer. I just want you to thank this good. Go ahead, Sydney. You can go I'm just kind of supplementing that what Ben said. You're going in with an agenda. You're kind of picking out of the Bible what fits your purposes. Well, but now the question is, you know, to take the Bible objectively, what we're saying is, is really not to come with an agenda. Subjectivism would come with an agenda. So you want to maybe that they're coming to the Bible rather than saying, speak to me through your word, or saying, reveal to me what actually is the word. Okay, and that's, that's a good, good way to put it. So, you know, the Bible contains the word of God. Here's the Bible. There's the word of God, somewhere in the middle, right? I've got to cut away all this extra stuff, like the, you know, layers to an onion. But somewhere in there is the word of God. Really. It's contained in the Bible. But it is objectively there. You follow that? Okay. So it's still an objective approach, though liberal. Less of the Bible is the Word of God than the Orthodox folks thought, but there's still something out there. Now we get even further from this when we talk about Bart, but Boltmann would say even Bart makes the mistake of taking the Bible objectively. See, he says everybody's done it wrong until Boltmann. Boltmann has saved us from this horrific abuse of the Bible where everybody wants to take it. Now, in what sense do you suppose Bart takes the Bible objectively? Brains thinking. Can anybody pull that one out? In what sense does Bart violate the principle, according to Bullman, of taking the Bible too objectively. Megan? Well, he believes the Bible is a witness uh, to, to God speaking, so okay. there's no higher standard than an eyewitness. Okay, that's, that's pretty good. Boltman would say that Bart, though he does not believe the Bible is the Word of God or even contains the Word of God, he thinks the Bible is a faithful witness to the Word of God, and it's basically reliable as a witness. So we care about what it says. I care about the, the fact that the Bible tells me Jesus rose from the dead on the third day because that represents, from Bart's point of view, an authentic historical witness to the fact that he really did rise. It's not the Word of God, but it is giving me a faithful rehearsal of what happened in history which may be the point where I hear the Word of God in my life. You follow that? That's still kind of objective, isn't it? You with me here? Yeah. Bart says, or Boltman says, all of that's bad. There is no sense in which you should approach the Bible objectively at all. You need to approach the Bible in a purely subjective fashion. You not only are permitted to, you are required to come to the Bible with an agenda. And the way that you ask the questions and hear the answers is in the process of demythologizing. So Fultman says the Bible is loaded with myths. Virtually the whole book is myth. It's myth from one end to the other. Resurrection of Christ, myth. Probably most of the life of Christ, myth. Certainly the miracles of Christ, myth. You know, it's all myth. It's pretty much the same kind of myth as you'd find in, you know, Greek myth. It's just myth. But what's the purpose of myth? Myth is intended to answer life's deep questions, but you have to ask the questions. You know, it's your questions that you pose 
to the myths of the Bible in order to get meaningful answers. <sighs> How I'd like to proceed in this discussion, but once again, the relentless, tyrannical clock has dropped its sword of Damocles in my path. <laughs>